Bibles, I'd like to invite you to turn with me to the New Testament. We're still in Paul's letter to the Galatians. In chapter 1, no? So Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 to 24. This is also printed on pages 2 to 3 of your bulletin. Listen now to God's word. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who had called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Kephas and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. In what I am saying to you before God, I do not lie. <coughs> then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only were hearing it said, He who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith that he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So keep your Bibles open. Galatians chapter 1. We're continuing today in our study of Paul's letter to the Galatians. And here in this particular epistle, Paul is very concerned over his readers or his hearers. These were his spiritual children who had at first received the gospel he preached with openness and gladness. But now they are turning away from the truth for distortions of the gospel, which are really no gospels at all. You'll remember the word gospel means good news. And Paul's whole point here is, I am so shocked you are turning away from the good news and you're turning towards quote unquote good news that is really no good news that is really bad news and this explains the firm tone with which he addresses them as we have seen last week in verse 6 I am astonished he says that you so quickly are deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel they were not just turning away, as it were, from a theology. They were turning away from Theos, from God who has called them. And Paul was alarmed. He was astonished. You see, there were certain Jewish individuals who had come to them preaching a false gospel of faith plus rituals, plus works. Presumably, they had come from the mother church in Jerusalem and were associated with Peter and the other original apostles. They were further causing disruptions 
where the accusations that Paul was Paul was just a convert and that his gospel was therefore incomplete and his authority inferior to the Jerusalem apostles. And for this reason, the Apostle Paul had to address this in his letter in order to defend his apostleship and ministry. And that's what he does here. He takes about two chapters in the letter to the Galatians uh, to defend his position and his ministry, his apostleship. But today we're just going to concern ourselves in the first, well, a part of that defense, no? in chapter 1, verses 11 to 24. Here, in this section, Paul gives an autobiographical account of his conversion and calling. And today, as we consider this account of the transformation of his former murderer turned missionary, we will be looking at the next uh, the text under three headings. Right? These are printed on page three of your bulletin. Number one, not man's gospel. Number two, taught by the Holy Spirit. And number three, the message validates the messenger. Okay? Not man's gospel, taught by the Holy Spirit, and the message validates the messenger. Now, little children, there are three key words I'd like you to uh, remember and ask your parents as you go home that correspond with these three headings. The first one is power. You see, this gospel that Paul was preaching had power to change because it's not from man, it is from God. So that's number one. Number two, light. You see, when Paul went away after he was converted, he didn't consult anyone. He was taught by the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit shined light into his heart as he was considering uh, Christ. And then the third one, little children, is seal. The message validates the messenger. Okay? So the message of the gospel, when it is preached faithfully, it validates or it seals, it, it puts a stamp of approval on the messenger. Okay, so little children and parents, uh, those are three headings uh, under which I hope you can discuss this text as you go home. Okay? So let's look at the first point, not man's gospel. Look with me again in verses 11 to 14. Paul begins by saying, For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it from a through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism before, beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. Now, the book of Acts, okay? Uh, a few months ago, we rounded up our series in the book of Acts, but we stopped short of Paul, right? We finished uh, the first part uh, after Pentecost, but we stopped short of Paul because we ended with the martyrdom of Stephen. But uh, Paul already made a cameo there, right? At the very last verse. Uh, there was that young man Saul, okay? But in the book of Acts, we have an account of a young man, see, standing approvingly at the wayside as the church's first martyr, Stephen, was being stoned to death. That young man was a Pharisee named Saul of Tarsus. And he is the same Paul who is now writing this epistle and who is the apostle to the Gentiles. Here, he reassures them that the gospel that he preached and that the Galatians had formerly received with open hearts was not man's gospel. Contrary to the accusations, ah, Paul is just a convert. Paul just received his message from other men. Paul says, no. The gospel that was preached by me, he said, is not man's gospel. In Greek, the, the literal expression is 
it is not a gospel not according to man. And Paul says that the gospel he preached to the Galatians has its origin from the direct revelation of Jesus Christ himself. This is in contradistinction with the accusation by the false teachers that Paul was just a mere follower, a convert, a disciple who learned his doctrine from other men but who did not rise to the level of a Peter or a James or a John. True apostles who were associates, eyewitnesses of the ministry and person of the Lord Jesus Christ. These Jerusalem apostles, the, these false teachers were seemed to be peddling this idea to the Galatians. The Jerusalem apostles, they're better, they're pillars in the mother church. Who's that Paul? So Paul needed to, to assure the Galatians that no, I am sent by God. The gospel I preach is not from man. And he had to defend his apostleship. Look, Paul seems to say, you've heard of who I was before I was converted. You know my history. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. I was there at the stoning of Stephen. I was approvingly there. And then I was zealously trying to put an end to what I viewed then as an aberrant messianic sect in Jerusalem. That's how Paul viewed the early church. The way it's called. Before it, before it, the, the church was uh, trivia. The Christian church was first called a Christian church in Antioch. But in the early days, it was simply called the way. Okay? And Paul viewed this group of, of, of the way as an aberrant Jewish sect that needed to be crushed, that, that threatened the purity of the God-revealed word. He's very zealous. Remember Acts 9, Paul seems to tell his readers. But of course, they couldn't because Luke had not written it yet. But they were well acquainted with Paul's story. So, very briefly, we're going to take an excursus back to Acts 9, just so we get the context of, of what he's saying here, okay? So turn with me, if you can. If you can't, you can just listen. Acts chapter 9. Uh, it's quite a long passage, verses 1 to 22. Here, Luke writes, he says, But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest, and ask him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So that's the context. Paul, this young Pharisee, went to the high priest, asked for permission, letters of recommendation, so they could go to Damascus, to the synagogues, Okay, and show them and ask them, where's the watch list? I'm gonna go door to door. I'm gonna arrest them. If they fight and I feel threatened, I will use deadly force. It seemed that was what Paul was bent on doing at this point in Acts chapter 9. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, this is verse 3, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? Probably not in that tone. Probably in, with more fear. Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. 
Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now, there was a, disi there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he had seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. And then verse 13, very curious. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man. How much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. Lord, suicide mission. <laughs> but the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. And then for verse 17, Ananias obeyed. So Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus has appeared to you on the road by which you came. The, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes. And he regained his sight, then he rose and was baptized. And taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus. And immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God! And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon his name, this name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul, verse 22, increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. And so you will see here, in the narration of events, it fits with what Paul is saying in the letter to the Galatians. He was on his way to persecute the church in Damascus, the Christians in Damascus. And then he encountered the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he was subdued by Christ. And then after Ananias came, prayed for him, he he regained his sight, he was baptized. Immediately, or at least not long after, he was already preaching in the synagogues and he was saying, Jesus was the Christ. Okay? No mention in Acts that he went to consult with anyone. Ananias did not teach Paul. Ananias' sole purpose was to pray for Paul so that uh, he might be confirmed that it is from the Lord, that it is the Lord himself that he met at the road, and so that he may be baptized. And that's it. <clears throat> Ananias didn't go there and give him a crash course in uh, Christocentric interpretation. You know, Brother Paul, when the Lord Jesus Christ arose, he appeared to two men uh, on the way to Emmaus, and then uh, beginning with Moses, he opened up. Let me, let me explain to you from... No, 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 he never did that. All he did was he prayed and he baptized. And soon after, Paul was in the synagogues. And he was, he was powerful and he was debating and he was, he was proving how Jesus is the Christ. And so you could just imagine the significance of this account. Paul was a devout Jew. He was zealous for the traditions of his fathers. He was much advanced, he says, in Judaism beyond his contemporaries. He knew the Old Testament well. That's the thing that you need to uh, take note of. Paul was a Pharisee. And he was not just a mediocre Pharisee. He was a prodigious Pharisee. 
he memorized the Torah. That we can be sure of. Because Pharisees memorized the Torah, and in addition to that, they memorized the Mishnah, which is additional interpretations on the law. And so Paul was a law expert, if ever there was a law expert. He knew the Old Testament like the back of his palm. But before this encounter with Jesus, his eyes were darkened. How beautiful is it in the picture of the scales falling off, as it were, from his eyes? How symbolic. All his life, he's been studying the scriptures, but the, never having spiritual understanding and insight. And so this is huge. The reason why Paul writes this to the Galatians is because this is huge. What's happened to him? Look, you know my history. You know my past. I was a hopeless case. I'm sure the, the early believers thought I was a hopeless case. Nobody even dared come and preach the gospel to me. And cut their throat. Or bring them bound to the chief priest in Jerusalem. So it's huge. Paul was a murderous enemy of the church. But by the but on the road to Damascus, King Jesus overcame him and made him bow the knee. I'm reminded here of our shorter catechism in question and answer 26. How does Christ execute the office of a king? Answer, Christ executed the office of a king in subduing us to himself. In ruling and defending us. And in restraining and conquering all his and our enemies. Nowadays, you don't... Uh, when, you, when you think about conversion... You don't think so much about being subdued, isn't it? But we forget that Christ is King. And if you will be His follower, you will bow the knee. And that's what happened here to Paul. And so through this direct revelation of Jesus Christ to Paul, the murderer of Christ's church was turned into the missionary of Christ. Let's try to apply this. Paul's gospel, the good news we find in pages of the Bible. Elsewhere, Paul says, it is the power of God for salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Romans chapter 1 verse 16. And Paul's story here, if anything, should encourage us. This means you see that there are no hopeless cases. Yesterday, um, I was messaged by a bashmate from high school. Um, he's, he's a guy who uh, professes atheism. So I was surprised to receive a message from him. I thought, oh, finally he's come around. He's asking me about Jesus. No, he says, uh, bro, um, where did you buy the lobster roll that you posted on Facebook? <laughs> Apparently, he supplies live made lobsters, and so he was curious. Uh, and then afterwards, I, because I was so surprised, uh, and uh, we have a mutual friend who's also a believer, I messaged that friend of mine and said, Bro, uh, I'm so surprised I received this message from, from this guy. And he says, Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he's, a, he's an atheist, I don't know. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's really hard. He says, I said, Yeah, I know it's hard, but you know. Uh, I'm so encouraged by the Apostle Paul because if there ever was um, a, a hopeless case, an impossible case, that must have been the Apostle Paul. And so that's one of the things that we can draw from this point. The Gospel is the power of God. And we see that in the life of Paul. He was, he was bent on destroying the church in subduing Christ. Irony of ironies, Christ subdued him. And the murderer he made into his missionary. So there are no hopeless cases. You may have people in your life 
You've been praying for for so long. Your family members, your office mates, do not lose hope. Because as long as they have breath, there is hope. Are your family members more knowledgeable of the Old Testament than Paul? Are your family members, are your friends bent on destroying the Christian church? Are they marching on behind the banner of hell to destroy Christ and his people? In that sense, they cannot be worse than Paul. Worse off than Paul was prior to meeting Christ. And so don't lose hope. The gospel is powerful to change. And so pray. But this gospel only applies, this only applies where the unadulterated gospel is held and proclaimed. A gospel that is not for man. Because anything else in, is in the final analysis deadly poison. And no matter how sweet you make poison to taste, it will still kill you. That's number one. Not man's gospel. Number two. Taught by the Holy Spirit. Look down verses 15 to 17. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went away to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Now earlier in Acts chapter 9, we already read that uh, it doesn't, Luke doesn't tell us that he went out to Arabia, but Luke tells us what happens after he went to Damascus and he was preaching in, in the synagogues. Okay? But the point that Paul is making is, I didn't go to the apostles, those who were apostles before me. Not because they are uh, superior to me, not, not before me in the sense that they are superior to me. <laughs> Before me in the sense that they were called before I was. Okay? But he didn't go there. Paul here continues with his autobiographical account. God called me by his grace, he says in verse 15. And ever the predestinarian, Paul says that God has set me apart before I was born. Such a wonderful picture, isn't it? Paul says, God... Um, <coughs> He who had set me apart before I was born had called me by His grace. This is an acknowledgement that in God's economy, there is no such thing as a wasted past. <clears throat> Maybe, you know, as a believer, you often look back to your reckless and, and foolhardy previous life and you hate yourself and you beat yourself up and say, oh, what? I, 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 I grieve that I did such and such a thing and that I uh, was like this and I was like that. I wasted so many years. But you know what? In God's economy, none of that is waste. And we see that in the Apostle Paul. He spent his life studying the Torah in order to hold fast to the traditions of his fathers. But now in Christ, none of that goes to waste. And in, in, in the larger scheme of things, God had set him apart even before he was born. So there's an encouragement here for us. There's no such thing as a wasted past. God decrees and works all things together for the, for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purposes. You know, a few years ago, in, in one of our lay leaders' conferences in ETF, it was held in, in Cagayan de Oro, and I remember very distinctly this Filipino pastor. He was an ex-convict. He's a pastor now, but he used to be a criminal, and he did time. And because of that, he developed this, this burden to minister to 
uh, those who were be behind bars. And he had a very unique ministry, prison ministry. You see, what he'd do is he, he worked out that the prisoners, in, in the daytime, they have responsibilities. And so it's very hard for him to actually um, stay with them, uh, talk to them, because they're busy with, with duties. And so you know what he did? Knowing the prison system, he gets himself locked up overnight. So he could preach the gospel to prisoners. And none of and so in God's economy, none of that goes to waste. He was a criminal. He was a, an enemy of, of the state. He was a prisoner. He was incarcerated. And now he voluntarily makes himself a prisoner for the gospel. To win people to Christ. Nothing is ever wasted in God's economy. Your past foolishness, your present sufferings, your struggles, your pain, your training or your lack of training, all these, God works together ultimately for your good. You may not see it now, but one day you will. You may not see it when you want to, but you see, that's how providence is. The English Puritan John Flavel, uh, in one of my favorite quotes, he says, The providence of God is like Hebrew words. They can only be read backwards. Now, of course, he was being geeky and he assumed that everybody understands that Hebrew is written from right to left. But that's the same point he's trying to make. The providence of God is like Hebrew words. You can only see it in retrospect. Nothing goes to waste. And indeed, Paul here gives us that picture of God's sovereign and divine providence in his own life. God allowed everything that Paul experienced prior to his conversion because God had a plan and a purpose. When he got converted, called, and sent to be a missionary to the Gentiles, Paul says he did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem, to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned to Damascus. What was Paul's point? He was not taught by any man. That was that's what he that's what he was saying. And, and it used to be when I would read this passage, I would think, wow, how amazing for Paul to be out in the wilderness in Arabia and then Jesus speaking to him and, and instructing him. But it doesn't seem like that's what happened. You see, like I said, nothing went to waste. He was a, he was a, an expert in, in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Scriptures. And his going away was more so that he might commune with God. And the Holy Spirit were bringing to mind this time around all of these things that you memorize, that you know the Spirit is now bringing back illuminating and making clear that Jesus is the one to whom all of that points to. He was not taught by anyone, any man, but by the Holy Spirit himself giving him illumination. And how could that be? Well, here's the deal. Paul was a good catechism boy. Not in Christianity, but in the scriptures of the Old Testament. And when Jesus confronted him on the road to Damascus, it all began to click. It is as if, as Jonathan Edwards puts it, it were a case of a divine and supernatural light immediately imparted to the soul by the Spirit of God. That's a sermon, by the way, I recommend that you look up. It's free on monitors and you can read it. And so here's an encouragement, dear parents. Let me address the parents. I want to encourage you to catechize your young children. They may not understand it yet at their tender age, but the memorization of these doctrinal categories of thought will, by God's grace, by God's grace, 
what they click when their minds begin to grow and mature. And here's an encouragement for those of you who aren't parents, for the adults, the singles. Catechize yourself. <laughs> it has always been my position, I've always said this, the best systematic theology you could study and familiarize yourself with is the Westminster Standards, read and memorized all the while with an open Bible. Master the doctrine contained in our standards and you will be far better off than reading different books. In fact, gives you an excellent foundation as you move on to reading other systematic works. And so there is a very important and practical use for catechism, for doctrinal study. That's what you see in Paul. He knew all of it, but his eyes were darkened. And then he meets Jesus, scales fall off, boom, everything clicks. And so persist in that. I know some of you are memorizing the Shorter Catechism. Persist in that. You will reap dividends for the rest of your life as a believer. And for the parents, I know it's it's very difficult, especially for, for little kids. Very difficult for us because they're so difficult to sit down. <laughs> but then you know, at, it's, it's at this tender age that they're like sponges. They're just they're just gonna absorb all of that. They're not gonna understand all of it, but one day they will, and it's gonna be okay. Now this, of course, does not excuse the need for you to continually and regularly meditate on Scripture. There was a Latin phrase during the Protestant Reformation uh, that was, uh, you can say, one of the rallying calls, Spiritus cum verbo. The Spirit works through the Word. If you want the Spirit to talk to you, open your Bible. If you want wisdom for particular situations, then you got to put in the time. Study, meditate the Scriptures. You know, in all of you, there is a bank. A wisdom bank. You got to put deposits of wisdom in that bank. So that you can withdraw those wisdom when the time comes, when it's most needed. If you wait until you face a calamity or trouble to open your Bible, you're not gonna avail much from it. Maybe you can, but more, more, more likely what you're gonna do when you wait until you are, your, your mind is clouded, you're facing trouble to open your Bible, you're going to do divination. You know what divination is? Lord, what is your will? Turn randomly, and then you try to squeeze out the meaning you want in the scripture. That's, just, that's not how it works. The Spirit works through the Word as you apply yourself diligently to the study, the reading, and the meditation. The Holy Spirit works through the Word, and this is His ordinary modus operandi. The reason Paul was able to increase in strength and confound the Jews in Damascus, this is what Luke writes in Acts chapter 9 verse 22, was because he had mastered the scriptures and the Holy Spirit was now shining light both upon the text of the word and upon his now regenerated heart. He mastered the word, or better yet, we must say, he was mastered by the word. This is the Holy Spirit's work of illumination, without which no one can read and understand the Bible with spiritual insight and understanding. And this is why some people do not respond to the Gospel call. They need first to have a divine and supernatural light immediately imparted to their souls by the Spirit of God. So we need to read, but more than that, we need to pray. Third, the message validates the messenger. 
verses 18 to 24. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Kephas and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James the Lord's brother. And what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. There wasn't Facebook then. They only were hearing it said, He who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of it. It is only after three years, three years of active ministry in Damascus, that Paul actually goes to Jerusalem for a meet and greet with Peter or Kephas. Okay? Kephas is the uh, Aramaic form of his name. What's the point that, that Paul is making here? Paul is saying, essentially, that I already had a robust understanding of the gospel and a vibrant proclamation ministry even before I had met another pillar of the early church. He goes back now to defending his apostleship and the message that he preached. And while he stayed with Kephas for about a fortnight, 15 days, he did not learn the gospel from him. He already knew it. Well, while he was there, he also saw another luminary in the Jerusalem church, James, the Lord's brother. But apart from the two, Paul says, he did not get to spend time with any other apostle. For whatever reason, we're not sure. Some say because the people were still, you know, three years on, but they're, they're still a bit worried that, he's a, that he is a double agent. Okay? But Peter met him, and he, he met James, the Lord's brother. But he did not learn from them, nor did he receive his commission from them. So bear in mind, Paul's point is this. Three years, of ha three years later, after having my Dam Damascus Road encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, after having been commissioned by Him, sent by Him, I went for the first time up to Jerusalem as an apostle to meet fellow apostles. That's what he was saying. And it's interesting how forceful a point Paul tries to make uh, of this in, in verse 20 the, in the parenthetical phrase in what I am writing to you before God I do not lie he says and what he says is true Paul is in every way a counterpart of the Jerusalem apostles in stature and mission but it is not just his personal conversion and commissioning experience that validates him it is his message and ultimately, that's how it translates to us today. Because today, your pastors, your leaders, they cannot claim the same thing. I was walking home in Savior Bill Avenue, and then suddenly, a, a bright light shone around me. It doesn't happen like that anymore. It was special, particularly for Paul. And so, what validates the messenger is the message. And we see that even in, all, in Paul's own experience. Look at verses 21 to 24. He says, Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only were hearing it said, He who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they glorify God because of me. There you go. That's the validation. They glorify God because of me. Because he who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. He was trying to pull us down. He's now trying to pull us up. And he's preaching the same message we received. He's preaching the same message that was preached to us by the apostles. Glory to God. And that's like the capstone to, to his, his argument in this section. I am validated ultimately by the gospel I preach. That's what he started with. That's what he ends with. The message validates the messenger. The message makes the messenger. 
So we must always be vigilant, test every doctrine against the express teachings of the Bible. I cannot stress it enough to you, my dear friends. I am not infallible. I apply diligence in the study of Scripture and I try with the strength that God gives me by His grace to be faithful in discharging my duty. That is to open up the Scriptures and to apply them to you. But, I'm not perfect. And so you should always be vigilant also even when you listen to me or anyone who stands here or anyone who takes upon himself the task of preaching the word. It is the message that validates the messenger. Later in Romans chapter 1 verses 16 to 17, Paul writes, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, the Jew, for, the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And so what do we learn as we close today's meditation on the Word? Number one, the gospel is the power of God. But it is only powerful in so much as it is the same gospel that Paul preached. The one he says that is not man's gospel. Number two, there are no hopeless cases, only helpless cases. Can we agree on that? There are no hopeless cases, but there are many helpless cases. And so we need to hold out Christ as the only hope and help of sinners. Number three, by God's grace, the Holy Spirit works through the faithful proclamation of the gospel. You know, one of the comforts that I have as a preacher is that though on Sunday afternoons sometimes I would I would be trying to relax and thinking, oh, I should have said this instead. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. One of the comforts I have is that the Holy Spirit works through the Word. The Word read, the Word preached. And my prayer is that as I preach externally, the Holy Spirit will censor and the Holy Spirit will preach internally into your hearts, making His Word real and applying it for your present situation. By God's grace, the Holy Spirit works through the faithful proclamation of the gospel. Number four, the message validates the messenger. And again, we need to say there is only one gospel. And so we come to the end of it. Do you know this one gospel? More pointedly, do you know that Jesus heralded in this gospel of grace. You know, it's been said in the final analysis, we are all going to be judged by works. The final analysis, every single human being will be judged according to works. But the question is, whose works are you resting upon? If it is your own work, can I give you a spoiler? Your works are going to damn you. Your imperfect, sin-stained works will avail nothing on Judgment Day. And so you and I, we're going to be judged by works. But by God's grace, he demonstrates His love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ came in full obedience to the Father. And His works 
received by grace through faith alone justifies sinners. The question for you is, and for me, whose works are you resting upon? Your own or Jesus' works? Turn to Jesus today. Rest fully upon his finished work on the cross. And know the joy and the peace that comes being of being, with being united to Him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we give you thanks for your word. We give you thanks that uh, in this curious account we have this autobiographical um, narration by Paul uh, defending his apostleship, defending his uh, his the gospel that he preached. And here we are reminded of a lot of things. We're reminded, Lord, that the gospel is the power for salvation. And so because it is, there's only one gospel, we are not to meddle with it. We are to um, proclaim the gospel in its purity, but also in a way that people can understand. We learn also that there is value and wisdom in studying and meditating upon the scriptures in humility and faith, expecting that the Spirit will give us illumination. And we also learn that for those of us who take upon ourselves the task of being your witnesses, it doesn't matter what, what we say about ourselves, because in the final analysis, it is our faithfulness to the gospel message that will make us as messengers, that will validate us. And so we pray, Lord, that in the coming days and weeks, even as we consider our own witness, and even as we continue to, to meditate upon the gospel and preach the gospel for ourselves, Lord, that you might so shape and order us in accord with these truths, so that when we, when the time comes for us to uh, give a defense for the hope that we have, we may do so in faithfulness and boldness, and people hearing will give glory to God on account of us. We thank you for hearing our prayers, and we continue to ask, Lord, that you um, set our hearts and minds aright this Lord's day as we uh, worship you um, and as we rest uh, in you alone. We pray these things in Jesus' name.